Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. We are headed for an incredible show today because our guest today is Mr. Gerald Salente, the founder of Trends Journal. Gerald is famous as an economic trends forecaster. His predictions have been shockingly accurate over the past three decades. He's one of our favorite guests because he is incredibly dynamic and we always get some real really great insights into what is taking place behind the scenes. And with so much happening in the markets right now, this is going to be an amazing interview. Gerald, welcome to the show. How are you today? Oh, I'm fine. Thank you for having me, Michelle. And thanks for all that you do. Oh, we are thrilled that you are here. Let's start off, Gerald, with the precious metals market. Now, we have been watching gold and silver going up beautifully over the past few months. Today, however, silver is down to 1860 and gold is about $1,500. So the question is, what is happening here? Because there seems to be signs of manipulation within the markets. Paint the whole precious metals picture for us. Well, there's always manipulation in the market. How about that thing they have called a plunge protection team? It's hey. hard to believe, Gerald, that that's even a thing. You know what I mean? But it's real, right? It's real. Oh, yeah. That other, that, that bankster, Alan Greenspan, they started that in 1987 and when the, the crash happened, which I also had forecast in the beginning of the year. The year it will all come down was my, my headline story. But going back to gold, I've been trading gold since 1978. My first buy was $187 an ounce, 77, 78. And so I've been at this a long time, and I've been negative on gold for almost six years. And I changed that forecast on June 6th. We sent out a trend alert to our subscribers. The gold bull run has begun. Gold was at $1,322 an ounce. For nearly six years, I've been saying gold has to go over $1,450 an ounce for it to break solid. And when it does that, it's going to head to a 2000. That's happened. It going down from what about, you know, a high of about what, 1552 to where it is now at about 1550. You know, this is just a correction. And it has nothing to do with the trade wars, the easing up, or no tensions in Hong Kong. It has to do with, you know, Michelle, I love being on your show. I got a great deal for you. I got this 10, 20, or 30-year bond. And after 10, 20, or 30 years, because I like you so much, you're going to get less back than what you paid for it. We're going to call it negative yields. Uh -huh. And by the way, put your money in that Swiss bank over there and you'll get a minus 0.75% interest rate. That's because I like you so much. You can't make this crap up. That's why people are going into gold. This is a temporary downturn. Our down point on gold is about $1,400 an ounce. And that's not a lot when you're looking at futures. As to silver, silver is going to mirror gold. It has all my life, and I believe it's going to continue doing that. So this is just a temporary downturn. Look, you're starting to read one article after another, one after another coming out of Europe that, you know, these negative interest rates are really hurting, and they're not doing a lot. And I mentioned the cat that gave us the uh, plunge protection team, and they have a national team over there in China, one after another. Their market riggers, Alan Greenspan, he came out a, a couple of days ago and said, you know, we may be going into negative rates in the United States. So the lower the rates go, the higher gold goes up. And very interesting and very important. The dollar is at a two-year high. With a dollar this strong, gold should be nowhere near where it is. It should be way lower. It's up even though the dollar is up because the smart money knows how bad the situation is. Interesting. Now, talk to us about these negative interest rates that are taking place in other places in the world because this is a very scary phenomenon. Here's the deal. Mm -hmm. They need to stimulate the economy. You look what's going on, I'll give you an example. You have to, th globally, nothing to do with, nothing to do with trade wars. India, 
the fastest growing economy in the world up until very recently, five quarters of declining GDP, five. Their nifty 50, boom, it's not so nifty anymore. You look at auto sales, they're down on average about 60%. You're looking at consumer spending, half of what it was, having nothing to do with trade wars. Now, what has India done? Well, let's lower interest rates four times in a row. Let's take a trip to Europe. Negative interest rates are ready. The, uh, they'll be meeting next week, the ECB, the European Central Bank, they're expected to bring them down from a minus 0.4 to a minus 0.5. Japan, negative interest rates. Both countries, negative bond yields. 30-year German bond, negative. One after another. They have no room to go lower. Now the United States. When the panic of 08 hit, interest rates are at about 5%. Now they're at 2%. You only could go down 2% to juice the market up. And they're going to do it. It's the presidential reality show. Trump will do everything he can to get reelected. He is in the real estate business. He knows when interest rates go up, real estate goes down. Real estate is already softening. Luxury sales in Manhattan, way off and around the country. The higher ends are going down. This is very important, Michelle, very important. We are headed toward the greatest depression. This time, when the markets crash, unlike back in 2008, it was a bottom-up crash. The subprime mortgages, people going deep into debt. This is different. This time, it's going to crash from the top down. It's going to be the bigs that come down. You're hearing from Ray Dalio, the head of Bridgewater Associates, the biggest hedge fund in the world, the founder and leader of it, coming out two weeks after we put out our June 6 trend alert, the gold bull run has begun. Now he's bullish on gold. After we came out on my forecast of the greatest depression, last week Ray Dalio said he fears we're going into a depression. So when I call this the greatest depression, this is going to be a lot worse than what happened back in the 1930s for a number of reasons. And here's a big one. Back in the 1930s, when the markets crashed in 29, they weren't shooting in stuff called quantitative easing and negative interest rates. They did all that to save us artificially by pumping in this monetary methadone to keep the addicted bull running after the markets crashed and, and the things started going down in 2008. So now we have about, they say a $250 trillion debt bubble. That number comes from two years ago. It's probably more like a $300 trillion debt bubble. So when this thing goes down, the whole world is going down with it. Wow. Wow. What's your prediction on the timeline here? It's hard to give a, a tough, a, you know, an accurate timeline on it because there are so many wild cards. That's why when people call me a futurist, it's, I'm not a futurist. Nobody can predict the future. There are too many wild cards, whether they're man-made or made by nature. And right now we got the wildest of wild cards, the Trump card. Right. So <laughs> when's it going to happen? We see it happening in around 2021 because they're going to do everything they can to stimulate the economy. And now they're already talking. They're already talking about, all right, we're running out of monetary methadone to shoot into the system. How are we going to do it? Well, the governments are going to create stimulus measures, stimulus measures. We'll build infrastructure. Name me one thing, one thing, just one, that the government has done that has been effective in bringing positive change. I can't think of anything. So the stimulus is going to artificially prop it up for, again, a short term. But long term, it's going to go down. So you start looking at what's going on in other nations. And I mentioned India. How about the lovely time going on over there in Hong Kong? Oh, yeah, the gateway to Western banks 
operations for all the Asian banks. That's why, by the way, China backed off on this thing. They don't want to see it go down. And talking about debt levels, China's debt level is 300. Debt to GDP level at 300. The United States is under 100. Japan is about 256. Oh, and China, they got a $40 trillion debt load. And now you're seeing declines going down all across China, all across India. India has almost a half a million, a half a million of uncompleted apartment projects that people paid for that they thought they were going to get the apartments that haven't been completed. China has the ghost cities. So this thing is going to go down really big. That is just such an extraordinary story because they built all of that infrastructure, all of those buildings and apartments, and then they just stopped. So it's like a huge, fabulous ghost town that's unlivable. Yeah, and and when I say it's going to be worse than the Great Depression, go back to 1930. It's not ancient history. There were two billion people on the planet. We've added 5.5 billion in under 100 years. So now, you leave in Africa, you leave in South America because you have poverty, you have corruption, you have crime, you have no future, your life is in danger, and you're fleeing out of these countries to go north of the border. What's going to happen when this thing goes down big time? It's not only a human wave that we have now, it's going to be a tsunami. And very important, when all else fails, they take you to war. And that's what you're seeing happening already in India. Hey, we just decided we're going to tear up that 1947 agreement. Kashmir no longer has any levels of autonomy. Pakistan has nothing to do with it. We got it all. That's what they just pulled off a few weeks ago. Now you have Pakistan and India, two nuclear armed nations. The Pakistan economy is in the toilet. doesn't even exist. India is going down, so we'll get your mind off things. And you're going to see more and more of that happening. And the other things to look at very carefully of the increasing United States, Israel, and Saudi Arabia action being taken against Iran. Because it's economic warfare going on. We're seeing the reports coming out, one after another, how this guy Hook one of the clowns that they call in security in the United States, call the captain of that ship, the Grace One, that the commandos, the British, took over and offered him millions of dollars to take the ship and put it into another direction. So, And you're seeing the pressure building. Then there's Venezuela with that economic warfare building up over there and a crisis building. So we have to look at the geopolitics because if things break out in the Middle East and oil prices skyrocket back up as they were many years ago to $100 a barrel, you're gonna see economies and you're gonna see equity markets crash. Wow. You know, staying with politics, Gerald, Talk to us about the 2020 elections and what you foresee. At this point, you know, we were the first, and I'm a political atheist, you know, to me, they're the bloods and the crips, the dumbo craps and the repulsive kins. You know, they disgust me. And very quickly, I began my career at a graduate school. I was chief, one of the chief people running the mayoral campaign in Yonkers, New York, a place of over 300,000 people. I worked in political campaigns in Westchester County, the richest county in the United States at the time, and was the assistant to the secretary of the New York State Senate, devised and instructed American politics and taught it at St. John's University. I have a background in this. So the politicians are basically people that you couldn't stand in high school and college that wanted to be class president and head of the student council. (laughs) That's who you got there. And when you look at the Democratic part of the presidential reality show, that's what you have. 
So at this point, and again, I was the first magazine, the Trends Journal, to forecast Trump a winner in 2014. I forecast the Trump market rally two weeks after he got elected, and then I forecast the decline. You know, so I, it's, it don't make any difference of who is in. At this point right now, if the election went held, held today, we say Trump would win again. You do. Is it simply because we have no viable candidates yes. on the Democratic side? Yeah, and they, they're not offering real solutions. I'll give you free education. I'll give you free health care. You know, Bernie Sanders, you buy two conditions, you get one free. Take it easy, Bernie, all right? We're going to get the dough. We're going down. Same thing with Elizabeth Warren. We're going to come up with the money. So they, they, they're just talking empty words. And Trump, what Trump knows how to do, he knows how to play the crowd. That's why he was the, that's why we call it the presidential reality show. He was a reality show champion. And that's all it is. It's a freak show. Liars, cowards, freaks, and fools. Step right up. It's the greatest freak show on earth. Yes. And by the way, we're not alone. Take a trip to England. How about Boris Johnson? You know, you can't make up better characters like these cats. Well, that little boy Macron over there in France. It's a freak show. It does seem to be the oddities of the population, because when you look at the general population, we have a lot of very cool people. And then when you look at the political candidates that we get to vote from, it's very strange. <laughs> it's really not, because I ask everyone to Google up the definition of a politician. Someone that runs a political office, blah, blah, blah. Next part, a person that's manipulative and devious typically to gain advancement within an organization. Manipulative and devious. Politician, that's the definition. So when anybody says about politicians or being politically correct, there's nothing politically correct about being devious and manipulative. So that's why political correctness is just a lot of crap. I didn't know that was the actual literal you definition. You can Google it up. Google it. You can do it right now. <laughs> it fits. Now, Gerald, let's step back to the trade war just for a moment between the United States and China. Do you think that in some way this may serve as a catalyst to help reignite the consumer manufacturing sector here at home? If it worked properly, it should and could. My belief, Michelle, is to have a self-sustaining economy. I'm up here in Clint, uh, Kingston, New York. We're about 90 miles north of New York City in the foothills of the Catskills. Farmers markets, buy local, buy local, buy local, buy local. By the way, I used to make Gantt shirt factories over here too. If you're going to buy local, how about buying national? You go a little bit north of here, Endicott, New York. Oh, Endicott Johnson, where they used to make the shoes. One after another, IBM was here. You know, one after another. The only way this country is going to come back is by having jobs to pay wages and manufacturing our own products. What, what do I care when Trump says we need a cheaper dollar so manufacturers could export more. What are they, what's he talking about? So Apple gets their products made by slave labor and then sells them in another country? What does that do for me? Levi, oh, you get your clothes made over there in, in Bangladesh or China or some other slave labor market, and then you bring them back here like Nike does with their shoes, marks up the prices so they can make more money? What does that do for me? Oh, well, you could buy it cheaper. Yeah, but you got lousy jobs because all everyone's become are plantation workers and the multinational plantation of slave landia. This is better than slavery. Work for Walmarts, work for Amazon, work and get no, or, or, or a fast food place, make no money, but we don't have to, as a slave owner, we don't have to feed you house you, even though it was lousy. You could sleep in your car and you could eat a lot of junk and then get back to work tomorrow. So that's all this has become. The only way this country is going to come back, or any country, 
is to have manufacturing base. And if you don't believe me, hey, there's a place called Germany. Oh, yeah. One of the biggest exporters of products in the world, the fourth largest economy in the world, and it's based on manufacturing, not consumption. Exactly. Exactly. We've become a consumer nation. And what's frightening is that even the jobs we have right now, automation is coming in. It's predicted to take over by, what is it, 36 million jobs within the next 12 years. So what jobs are we going to have left between automation and the fact that we import everything? We've got to change. Yes. And that goes back to the greatest depression. So now with the automation, robotics, and on and on, more jobs gone, more job, jobs gone, and more people looking for work. And, and you're going to start seeing very violent times starting happening in more and more countries. They'll blame it on populism, some stupid word, nationalism. No, when people lose everything and have nothing left to lose, they lose it. And you're going to see more people losing it. And that's why we're telling people now to prepare Take action, be aware, and prepare for the greatest depression. It's coming. And, and again, I don't give financial advice. I'm a trend forecaster. But for me, it's guns, gold, and a getaway plan because things can get ugly too. But gold to me is the ultimate safe haven asset, and it's proving its value now. You know, when I said to you I bought gold back in the late 1970s, they never used to even list gold. On, on many of the, in the newspapers back before the internet days. And then even when they started putting the sites up like the Bloombergs and the CNBCs, they wouldn't even list gold. That's how, that's how much they try to push it down. Because gold is the only way out, particularly when you're going into negative yields, negative interest rates, and you're going to see nation after nation after nation Print up more digital money, backed by nothing, and printed on nothing. It's just thin air money. And they're going to inflate it more and more, bring that debt bubble bigger and bigger, and we believe it's going to explode in 2021, if wow. not sooner. If not sooner? Yeah, because if a war breaks out, there are wild cards Two wild cards I just mentioned. What happened in Hong Kong? Who would have thought? You got a place of what, 7.4 million people? And you have some 2 million out in the street? Could you imagine that happening in America? We got 320 million. They made a big deal when they had pink pussy hats and a million people showed up. And then one day and then they're gone. And they're going out in Hong Kong week after week after week and in the pouring rain. That's a wild card. You never would have thought it would happen. India grabbing Kashmir. It's a wild card. What if there are other wild cards? Something happening in Venezuela, Iran. Boom, a flashpoint. That brings it down. It brings it right there. Or, or a number of banks going bust. And the banksters are in trouble. They don't want negative interest rates. They can't make profit with them. So you could have those kind of flashpoints that can make it happen sooner. Wow. That's really interesting. And I didn't realize how soon this was setting itself up to be a possibility. Now, shifting gears just a little bit, what is your perspective on cryptocurrencies? I think it, ha it has a place. And, and that's why they haven't gone away. Just as people buy gold for safe havens, there's a whole other generation buying cryptocurrencies for safe havens and not wanting to go into the national currency. Let's go back to Bitcoin. When did Bitcoin spike? Around 2015, 2016. Who was buying most of it? Coming out of China. How come? Poof, the yuan was going down sharply. One of the reasons why, by the way, they don't want their currency to go down is because of capital outflows. So what did the Chinese do? Boop. They banned cryptocurrency exchanges and trading them. One of the reasons why it's going back up in the Bitcoins in the 10,000 levels is that the Chinese are going around the individuals and trying to buy it through different strategies. 
So you're going. So the, so the people that don't go into gold or silver can't afford it, don't understand it, don't believe in it. They're going to go into cryptos. So I believe there's going to be a crypto base that's going to continue to grow. But again, for me, I want the hard asset. I don't want it in a digital world. But a lot of people in this digital life, that's their world. So it's fine with them. Yeah. Now. Do you foresee an official devaluation of the USD coming? No, I really don't. Uh, It may happen. And, you know, they're claiming that China is artificially bringing down its yuan. And we don't see that at all. uh, Because I'll give you a number of reasons why. China is the biggest importer of oil in the world. What's oil-based in many commodities? They're dollar-based, petrodollars. They got to pay more. China is a big importer. The lower the yuan goes, the more they have to pay for everything they're importing. About 80% of China's GDP, by the way, is consumer-based. Ours is about two-thirds to 70%. So it costs them more. Also, capital outflows. China's concerned about the money leaving the country. Will the United States devalue the dollar? I mean, I don't know. I, you know, it's a, it's a great question. Anything can happen. And, you know, when I hear the name Michelle Holiday, I think about the holiday they call a bank holiday, holiday. We're going to have a holiday, 1933. <laughs> you can't get your money out of the bank. It's a holiday. Uh-oh. Isn't that a use of the word? Oh, and by the way, turn in all your gold. If you don't, we're going to come after you. No, the democracy of the United States, they're going to, they can do that again. Remember what happened on 9-11. Wall Street closed down. And I know firsthand I had CDs. They used to have a thing called interest rates back then. And I wanted to get my money out and put it into gold. And I couldn't get it out because I called up and told them to transfer the money. I'm sorry, Mr. Salenti, certificates deposit of financial instruments. And Wall Street is closed, but it will reopen again. So again, a bank holiday could be around the corner. Oh my gosh. And a a surprise bank holiday. Yeah, well, of course, you know, they'll make up any story they want. And by the way, you can't go to your safety deposit boxes. We have to go there with you because terrorists would make up some terrorist story, you know, to give them an excuse to take if we have gold or anything else that they want. Now, would that be sort of a mechanism to see what you have inside your safety deposit box? Of course. Look, they call this a free country. They listen to everything you say. They watch where you're going. And now they got a recognition of your face. America, yeah, get rid of that C and put a K in it and put another S, U-S-S-A of United States of America. No, they turn us into a fascist state. It's corporatism. They're talking about, oh, if the Democrats get elected, there'll be socialism and we'll lose capitalism. We lost capitalism. There's no such thing in capitalism as too big to fail. Regardless of your size, you rise and fall on your own merits. Babe, but not here. We got to take care of the big cats. Yeah. And by the way, very important. Bloomberg reports $9 trillion federal central bank money going in to boost the economy since 2008, 2009. The... Levy Institute, Levy Economics Institute, Bard College, $29 trillion by the U.S. Central Bank to boost the economy and give the money to the too big to fails and the uh, bailouts of General Motors and anybody else we want to give our dough to. $29 trillion. Now, Gerald, where is that money? It's It's... That's why you're seeing gold go up, and that's why people go into cryptocurrencies. It's imaginary money. 
It's just digital. That's it. Wow. Wow. Now, with everything that we've spoken about, um, the crash that may in fact be incredibly imminent and the political unrest throughout the world, you know, we seem to be in a place of such intolerance of other people's different opinions right now, so much so that people are actually calling for others to be kicked out of restaurants or bullied or in Hollywood very recently, not even to be able to work. And what is so fantastic about our country is that we have freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom to vote. And the foundation that unites us as a country is the different opinions amongst ourselves and standing up for each other's rights to those freedoms. And I want to get your thoughts on what do you see as the solution to bring us back together as a country? That's a great question. Beauty and art. Art to me is the way of finding the true meaning of the human spirit. It was a thing called the Renaissance. When did the Renaissance happen? After the Black Plague, when about 60% of Europe was wiped out, people figured out, hey, maybe we're doing something wrong over here. Ali Romana Alla Antica, in the manner of the Romans and the ancients, to describe the quality of the work that was being created during the Renaissance. Beauty. But beauty cannot come in a state of fear and terror. We're going to have the military look out for you. We're going to have the cops watch out for you. It's, well, you got to fear everything. They've created a state of fear and terror. You can't create beauty in it. So as you're talking about the ability to express yourself openly, no, you can't. We're going to narrow it down to identity politics. We'll forget the wars. We'll forget the illegal wars that war criminals started, but we can't call them war criminals because they're our president. You know, let me tell you something, Michelle. You know that guy, Saddam Hussein, he has weapons of mass destruction and ties to Al-Qaeda? And that next cloud you see may be a mushroom cloud. Remember that one? Oh, yeah. Time and time again, war, 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 fear, fear, fear. When I was a young guy, you know, traveling first class, running late, going to, going, trying to get on the, the airplane, running through the gate. Not anymore. Now I got some freak feeling me up because I won't go through the electronic machines over there to get x-rayed. Yeah. Feel me up. Put it up. You know what? Look what's going on. Look what's going on. How can you create beauty in an atmosphere run by freaks and fools and cowards? So to me, it's Occupy Peace. That's what I've launched. Bring home the troops. No more spending our money overseas to enrich the military industrial complex. What the hell are you doing in Italy, in Germany, in Japan? Come on home. Put the money back in the country. Secure the homeland with the troops. You don't need a wall. This is the 21st century. We have all the technology we need to stop it. Put them to work to rebuild our rotted third world infrastructure. Give them skills. We need peace. With peace comes beauty. And as long as we're living in a state of war, there will be no peace and there will be no beauty. That's, it. That's the way I see it. It's really an attack on our Constitution. Oh, destroyed it. What Constitution? I don't like the Constitution. I'm going to change it. Another element of Occupy Peace, talking about the Constitution, only Congress has the right to vote to go to war. These little lying coward freaks have not voted to go to war since World War II. Hey, we'll give El Presidente the right to do whatever he wants or she wants if there's a she in there. Hmm. They have not voted. To, they, there is no constitution anymore. There are no Bill of Rights. There's no more Declaration of Independence. They destroyed it. We have freaks and fools and cowards and liars destroying what we had. 
And that's why I live here, by the way, in Colonial Kingston, New York, on the most historic four corners in America, where the siege of democracy was on. And I own three of the pre-revolutionary war stone buildings on that corner. And that's where I launched Occupy Peace. And that's why I bought them. And that's why I launched it. And right over here, you see it right there, the capital of a, Kingston was the capital of New York State before the British, and the British burnt it down, they moved it to Albany. The constitution that was written here, over 70% of America's constitution comes from what was written here. And John Jay, the famous Supreme Court justice, was a judge over here, as well as three other Supreme Court judges following him. So that's what I believe in. I believe in what this country was founded upon, and I don't need some people telling me to love it or leave it. No, you leave it. Don't you give me orders. I know what this country stands for, and you're not going to take it away from me because you're a coward and you want things your way. So again, to me, to answer your question, without beauty, there's no advancement. And without peace, we cannot have beauty. Talk to us about Occupy Peace. Yes, Occupy Peace, I found it in 2015. We closed down this historic Four Corners of America. I had Ralph Nader here, <laughs> Cindy Sheehan, brave woman, who camped out in front of George Bush's country house out there in Texas for months after her son was killed in Iraq. Dr. Robert Thurman, Uma Thurman's father, Gary Null, Dr. Paul Craig Roberts, Reagan's former assistant treasury secretary, and I launched Occupy Peace. It's the only peace program with an action plan. Number one, close the bases overseas. Over 800 bases in over 80 countries wasting our money. Bring the troops home. I call it a Troops Progress Administration to mirror the WPA program of the Great Depression when they had people building the Hoover Dam and highways and bridges putting the troops to work to rebuild our third world infrastructure and then giving them skills so when they get out, they can get good jobs. Because right now you could look everywhere, read anything you want. It's very difficult in the construction industry to find skilled workers. Number two, or that, uh, number three is to force Congress to vote to go to war, which they have not done since World War II. That's a violation of the constitution. And number four, on when they're ready to vote to go to war, we have a national referendum where we, the people on each state, will tell them what to do. Yes, we want to go to war. No, we don't want to go to war because we're the ones that pay for the war with our money and our lives. That's what Occupy Peace is. That's amazing. Do the people vote on this? Yeah, who the hell are these people? You know what, you know what all these politicians forgot? Two simple words, public servant. Can you get it in your head? Senator, congressman, councilman, mayor, president. You're a public servant. You do what we tell you to do. But they changed the whole game. Okay. I love it. every time a prime minister, a president, when they all get together, they roll out the red carpet and all these Guys and girls get dressed up in their favorite military drag and salute them. What the hell's going on over here? The founding fathers are rolling in their grave seeing what they've done to this. Who are they to order us around? Not in this country. It's supposed to be the other way around. And so that's what Occupy Peace is. Put the people back in charge. Absolutely wonderful. That's brilliant. Gerald, it is always amazing to have you on this show. Please tell everybody how to follow your work and all about Trends Journal. Well, they could get to Trends Journal. This is a new announcement that's just going out. We used to be a eight-page newsletter when we began in 1991. Then it went to a full color, color magazine, and it was quarterly. And then we went monthly. And now, in two weeks, we're going weekly. We are the Time Magazine of the future. Time Magazine is last week's news tomorrow. The Trends Journal is tomorrow's news today, history before it happens. So you can get to Trends Journal by going to trendsjournal.com, trendsjournal.com. And we put out, we broadcast podcasts three times a week and trend alerts each week. Yes. 
And Occupy Peace, where do they go to follow that? OccupyPeace.com. OccupyPeace.com and, you know, put your money where your heart is. The next thing we want to do is have festivals with music, entertainment, bring in speakers like Ron Paul and others, and also make it a festival because that's what we need. Liberty, love, joy, and beauty. That's what I want in my life. Absolutely. Gerald, thank you so much for coming on the show today. And thank you, Michelle. Thank you for all you do. Oh, Mr. Gerald Salente, expert economic trends forecaster and the founder of Trends Journal. For the Industry Experts Panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.